that in the chat or ask them at the end, inshallah. Share my screen and we can begin. We can hear you. Okay, good. Wait, just let me know if you can see my screen. I can't see the chat, so if anyone can just unmute and just say yes or no, that'd be great. Yeah, you're good. Okay, thank you. All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Mahra. I'm 21, and I am a dental hygienist, and that is what I am going to be talking to you about today. So there are a few things that are coming up that I will be speaking to you about today. First off, we will be discussing dental hygiene as a profession. We will be also talking about schooling for dental hygienists at the high school level, at the college level, and at the university level. We'll also be covering the duties and responsibilities that a dental hygienist is expected to maintain and uphold. And we will be determining if this is a good choice for you or not. And of course, we're gonna be talking about how much money you make working as a dental hygienist. Now, as I'm going along, I'm sure you guys might have questions or thoughts or concerns. So if you have any at all, I will address them at the end. Just write them down on a piece of paper or your notes app. And then at the end, we can definitely take questions and I can answer whatever concerns you may have. All right, so let's jump right into it. First off, we're gonna be talking about dental hygiene as a profession. So what is a dental hygienist? You guys have probably heard of an orthodontist, a dentist, a dental assistant. Dental hygienists, most people don't really know what they are, and those who do, they have a bunch of misconceptions about them. So a dental hygienist is a regulated healthcare professional, and we'll talk about what regulated means. And they work in a variety of settings. So they work in private practice, which is the regular offices that you guys go to. They work in public health. They work in hospitals, they work in long-term care facilities, and things like jail, things like a senior home, they go anywhere and they can work. They can work in educational institutions, like being professors or clinical instructors, and they can also conduct research, which is good. And as a dental hygienist, you can work independently or you can work with a dentist. Now, I just want to introduce you to some facts that I have about dental hygiene in Canada specifically. So it is the sixth largest regulated healthcare profession in Canada with 30,219 practitioners. And as a RDH, you are a primary oral healthcare professional. We provide preventative treatment. So that's treatment that prevents any disease such as teeth cleanings. They provide therapeutic clinical care. So if you have any infections or disease, we take care of that. Education is a huge thing, a huge thing. We do individual education and we do community education. So this would count as like community education since you guys are a community. We do health promotion. I'll give you an example for that later. And community work. And I have a really great example for community work as a dental hygienist in Windsor. So Windsor was a fluoridated community, meaning it had fluoride in its water in about 2018. And around 2019, it was removed. So one of my professors and a bunch of other dental hygienists in Windsor were advocating with the Windsor City Council to get fluoride reintroduced into the water since fluoride is really good for your teeth. It keeps them really healthy and strong and fights against any disease. And that actually worked. So with, through that advocacy, we actually have fluoride coming back into our water this fall. So that's an example of community work and it's super local. It's right in Windsor. Now, school-wise, Registered dental hygienists are graduates of accredited programs offered by 34 colleges and universities all across Canada. And I will talk about the different programs in just so you guys have a sense of what a dental hygienist is and what they do. All right, just another fun fact. So I told you guys that Canada has 30,219 registered dental hygienists. 96% of them are women which might sound scary to the boys, but there is a slight increase in men in dental hygiene in recent years. So what does a registered dental hygienist do? So here's just a comprehensive list. I have highlighted two that are the most significant that we will go into a little later. So first off, they conduct medical and dental histories. You know, to know what's happening in the mouth, you have to know what's happening in the body. They perform head and neck exams, so you know, we're checking out your head, we're checking out your neck, we're looking for any abnormalities, any variations, any signs of disease. 
We do the exact same thing through visual inspection to your teeth, gums, tongue, palate, cheeks, and tonsils. And we actually do something cool. We take intraoral photos. So we have a special camera. It's like a wand. And we put that inside your mouth and we take six photos just for documentation purposes. So that in case we see anything abnormal, we can take a photo of it and then recheck it the next time we see you. Obviously, we take x-rays. X-rays are crucial to dental hygiene. We clean teeth, which I will get into. We place fillings and sealants. You know, if you were a kid, you probably got sealants on your lower molars. We apply braces and brackets, so we work with orthodontics. Polish teeth, and we do whitening, mouth card, post-surgery care, nutrition and tobacco counseling, so we help you increase your nutrition in a proper way that will benefit your oral and overall health. And we actually help people quit tobacco, cigarette smoking, electronic cigarettes, all of that. We are allowed to prescribe medication. We conduct fluoride treatments, so that's through a foam or a rinse. We apply the fluoride. Oral hygiene instruction, you know, I'm sure everyone who's been to a dental clinic has gotten instruction on how to brush their teeth or floss their teeth. We administer local anesthesia. So if you don't know what local anesthesia is, it's that injection you get at the dentist. It just numbs your mouth. And the most important role is assessing and treating gum and bone disease. Now, treating gum and bone disease actually goes alongside with cleaning teeth. Because guess what? All of our teeth, they have bacterial buildup based on the food that we eat. So sometimes it can get, as you can see, there's buildup all along the teeth here. And if you smoke, you know, it turns black as well. So we have a bunch of different instruments. I just have a few here. This is definitely not a comprehensive list. These are manual instruments and we have some electronic ones. And we use that to get all that buildup off. And you can see the effects. You know, you here I have a picture of healthy gums. You can see how pink they are. They're nice, peaked and pointed. They're filling the spaces between the teeth. And here we see a very unhealthy mouth. We see, you know, it's not as peaked and pointed. It's very rounded. It's inflamed, meaning it's swollen. There's a lot of bleeding. So we work really hard to prevent that because if we don't prevent, prevent it, it advances to a disease known as periodontitis, which causes you to lose bone. So your teeth are is in your jaw. And if you if your jaw bone starts decreasing, you're going to lose your teeth. So everything that we do as a dental hygienist is to prevent this. But even if this does happen, that's okay because we can maintain it. We don't grow back bone, but we can maintain it. Now, after you go through schooling, you become a registered dental hygienist self-regulated comes in. So as a self-regulated professional, you can work independently. You do not have to work under a dentist like a dental assistant would have to. You can open your own practice as well. So if you want to work alone, you want to open your own practice, you definitely can if you'd like to. If you want to work with a dentist, that's perfectly okay as well. So in order to practice in Ontario, you have to be registered with the CDHO. So the CDHO is that purple thing I have there, College of Dental Hygienists of Ontario. Any self-regulated profession in Ontario, such as pharmacists, physicians, optometrists, nurses, they all have their own college. This isn't a school. This is a governing body. So the CDHO makes laws for dental hygienists to follow. So it is the CDHO that will give you your license to practice with. So they are crucial in your lives because you are getting your license from them. And the main purpose of the CDHO is to protect the public, and they do this by regulating dental hygienists in Ontario. So every dental hygienist out there, even yours, they are registered with the CDHO, and the CDHO is pretty much watching their every single move. Think of the CDHO as the FBI for dental hygienists. All right, moving on. Now, you're probably wondering that, okay, if dental hygienists can open their own practice, then how come I've never seen one before? The closest one near us is actually in Amherstburg, and it just opened in either 2019 or 2020. It's called Embrace Dental Hygiene, and it's a full, fully run independent dental hygiene practice. And it, the way that she did it is really cool. She made it into a spa. Another cool one that we have in Toronto, and this is very common, by the way. I'm sure there's some in Windsor, Essex County as well. There's mobile dental hygiene care. So you can open your own clinic on wheels. So you can have a van or an RV or a trailer or whatever, and you can turn it into a dental clinic with portable equipment, portable sterilization equipment. And I'll show you what that looks like from the inside. So you've got your... I'm going to see if I can open my laser here. Okay. You've got your windows. So... It's just a regular truck or van, and inside they have a complete dental clinic. 
So that's just one interesting way you can go about it. It's actually very common and it's also cheap as well. It's a cheaper alternative. And it's very good for accessibility for people in long-term care homes or those who are terminally ill and they can't leave their home. You know, you can just park in their driveway, do their dental treatment for them, and then you're off. All right, now the biggest thing that most people care about when it comes to dental hygiene is money. So in Ontario, you can be paid between $40 an hour to $70 an hour. I, you know, I just graduated from dental hygiene and some of the girls that I knew are already working and they're getting paid $52 an hour, which is a great start, starting salary. Within a year, you can make up to $82,000, which is quite a bit. So you definitely get paid good, but you are also doing a lot as you will learn throughout the presentation. All right, now we're gonna talk about schooling for the dental hygienist. So now you kind of know what a dental hygienist is, you know, how does she work, what does she do, who regulates her, how much does she get paid? So now we're gonna talk about schooling for the dental hygienist, which is the most important to you guys right now. So first off, how do you become an RDH? So there are five or six steps, depending on how you look at it. First off, high school prereqs. So these were my prerequisites. I had to have grade 12 college university level in biology, chemistry, and English. And the minimum final grade that we had to have was over an 80%. So that was what my program was like. You need to have those three prereqs. The second step is optional. I did co-op just to test the waters to see if dentistry was right for me. My school didn't have a dental clinic that they were you know, talking with about co-op. So I just asked my own dentist. I'm like, hey, can I do co-op here? And they were fine with it. So that's who I did co-op with. Thirdly, there is an entrance exam for dental hygiene. So there is the HOA exam, and HOA basically just stands for Health Occupation Aptitude Exam. The exam is designed to see if you will survive in a healthcare field. And there are four portions to it. There's math, so there's algebra, integers, fractions. The only catch is there's no calculator, so you've got to do it all in your head or in the paper that they give you. It also covers sciences. So there's biology, chemistry, physics, philosophy, earth, and space science. It asks just random questions on those topics. It also covers English. So there's comprehension. So you read the passage and you answer a few questions. And the last one is really interesting. There's spatial relationships. So when you are working as a dental hygienist, you're working with teeth. You know, teeth are different sizes, different shapes, and most of the time you can't see it, especially if they're in the back here. You know, you have your mouth mirror. This is the mirror that I'm talking about. I'm sure you guys have all seen it in your dental office. You know, you're working off a reflective surface or you're just trying to like bend your head to see it. So for that, they have spatial relationships. It tests your, you know, ability to conduct certain patterns. Like, can you put certain patterns together? Can you, you know, destruct certain patterns? So it tests you on that. For the HOA exam, there are a bunch of study guides that you can buy, and there's a bunch of online courses that you can do to prepare for it, but none of them will include spatial relationships because they want to test you on the spot for that one. So they cover math, they cover science, they cover English, but you can't expect much on spatial relationships. Okay, the fourth step is the most important. You need to attend dental hygiene school. So you go to a school that offers dental hygiene, and we are going to talk about that more in depth later on. The fifth step is that you have to write your National Dental Hygiene Certification Board exam. So this is a national exam for all of Canada. It runs um, every January and May, um, but they had an exception this year for COVID. They had it in, in September. So I actually wrote it one month ago yesterday, September 20th. And this is an exam that covers every single course you have taken throughout dental hygiene school. It's about a four hour exam with 400 questions and you have to get a minimum of a certain grade to pass it. So if you pass this exam, you are allowed to get a license from the CDHO. Remember that governing body, CDHO? So you get your license from them at the end if you make it through dental hygiene school and you pass your national board exam. Okay, so I hope we're doing okay with the information so far. So first off, you get your prerequisites, you do co-op if you want to, you take your entrance exam, you go to school, you write your board exam, and then you get your license. Those are the steps to becoming a registered dental hygienist, also known as an RDH. So I want to talk to you a little bit about co-op because I'm not sure how many guys have done co-op, how many guys have you not, you haven't done co-op. Co-op is cooperative education. You go out and work in the career that you want to enter in to see if you, you know, if you would fit in there. So I was in grade 12 when I did co-op. I was 17, just as most of you guys are probably right now. 
So I did co-op from February 2018 to, Jan to June 2018, and I was actually hired on after high school graduation as well. So the office that I worked at, the name has now been changed to White Dove Dental. They were a very versatile office, so I kind of was exposed to a bit of everything. So they had surgeries, they had dental hygiene, which was my specialty. They had restorative work, which just means fillings. They had prosthetics, dentures, and Invisalign. If you don't know what Invisalign is, it's braces, but with clear trays. So you don't have to get the middle all over your teeth. So as a co-op student at that dental office, I did a lot of reception work, booking appointments, calling patients, working with insurance companies, handling payments. This is payments from the client and even paying the actual staff. So like I have the assistant here, the two dentists, the hygienist, like I was in charge of getting their payroll out as well. I was in charge of sterilization. You know, you can't run a dental office without having clean instruments. So I was in charge of sterilizing that. So that's where I learned like, you know, this is this instrument. This is that instrument. This is how you sterilize this instrument. This is how you sterilize that instrument. Like everything has its own way. So I kind of like learned the ins and outs of all the instruments and all the processes. I was also shadowing the dentist and the dental hygienist. So seeing what each one does, how they do it. So, you know, when you see the same procedure done multiple times throughout like four months, you have a good idea of like what to do when you're doing, when you're watching it. You know, when I was watching them, I was like, okay, they're going to do that next. You're going to do this next. I kind of had an idea at that point. Um, I was setting up and cleaning rooms. I was doing a lot of inventory, ordering new items. So if we had, you know, if we were going to run out of gauze in two weeks, I was ordering more. So I was in charge of that. And they used uh, a software called Dentrix. So that's where I learned how to chart on computers, how to make patient notes, how to access the schedule. You know, I would come in a bit early before like the dentist would be there because the receptionist would be there. And I would see on the schedule, okay, so dentist A has a root canal. I got to get all this stuff out. Dentist B has a filling. I got to get all this stuff out. And that really helped in dental hygiene school because I was a little ahead of the game because what I had seen practically, I was learning in theory. So I kind of had an idea of what was going on. And that actually helped me excel in both classes and in clinic, which we'll talk about soon. So on to my program. So I'm sure all of you guys know where St. Clair College is. It's right in front of your school. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about my program and a few other programs that are offered for dental hygiene. So at St. Clair College, it was previously a two-year program, but it became a three-year program in 2014. The tuition is $14,000 per year. It actually decreased um, in 2018. If you guys remember, Doug Ford, he decreased college tuition by 2%. So it went from $15,000 to $14,000 for us. Now, the program of dental, of dental hygiene in St. Clair, it's a little unconventional. Usually, college universities, they have five classes a semester. We did not. We had nine to 11 classes per semester, along with clinics and labs. And, you know, I'll give you all the information about that as well coming up. So you have your classes where you learn, you know, you learn your theory, but you also have clinics. So everything that you learn in class, you will apply that in clinics. So here's the clinic right here. Um, you know, you it's a... A running clinic like everyone has their own little operatories you work on your clients there's a bunch of clinical requirements so one of the biggest requirements is treating clients so you will be required to complete uh clients if all ages children adults seniors you know one semester you might be doing seven one semester you might be doing 10 one semester you might be doing 12. it increases as you go on through the program in clinic, you will also be working at reception. So you kind of get exposed to reception work as well. You know, you learn how to deal with clients, booking appointments, all that. You will be taking x-rays. Of course, you have to practice how to take x-rays. We also perform whitening and mouth guards as well. So St. Clair College, it's actually a community dental clinic. So if you want to get a cleaning or a whitening, you can definitely go get it done. It's $25 for you guys. Now, as for classes... So the prerequisites for St. Clair were biology, chemistry, and English, but it, it is heavily biology focused. Like it's not really mitosis, meiosis kind of bi biology, but it's more like the human body. So you will have courses on anatomy. You will have courses on pathology, which is diseases. Microbiology, you will learn about embryology. So a lot of dental diseases, they originate from when you are a fetus. So you learn about the entire growth from like conception to delivery. Like that entire nine month process, you, you are going to learn every single detail about that. Pharmacology is a huge one. So pharmacology, you know, pharmacy, it's drugs. You know, 
there are so many drugs. Every single drug out there affects your dental health. And that will help you in clinic. Because let's say you had a client who had um, asthma. And as you guys know, asthma people, they take puffers. So if I see someone, my client has asthma and they're taking puffer, I think immediately, okay, they're taking a puffer. Puffer causes dry mouth and it causes fungal infection. So I have to tell them after you take your puffer, make sure you rinse your mouth so that you don't have a fungal infection. You know, so all these classes that you're taking, they come back to you in clinic. In clinic, you will always have clients with pages and pages of medication, especially seniors. They have so many. You have to know every drug out there and you have to know their side effects. You have to know their implications, what's going to happen with dental care just to prevent any sort of emergencies or medical emergencies. You know, you don't want to hurt your client. Next up, you have clinic theory. So clinic theory basically covers everything you do in clinic. You're going to learn about all of the treatments, all of the procedures. You have a research class. Dental hygiene is an ever evolving uh, profession. There are always new scientific research coming out and you have to be able to read it, analyze it, interpret it and apply it in your practice. So they really teach you how to read research and how to use it. Radiology is um, x-ray, so you learn about radiation physics. It's not very heavy on physics. You don't have to worry about like all those mirrors and everything. It's very slight physics. It's mainly about x-rays and how to take them. So you will have a class on x-ray theory, and then you will have x-ray labs where you actually go and take x-rays. Biostats, so you learn about statistics that you can use with research. You learn about ethics, how to ethically resolve any dilemmas or conflicts that you get into, and business. So if you guys remember, I said that as a dental hygienist, you can open your own practice. So there are business classes to help you understand how to open a practice, how to maintain finances, how to get a lawyer, how to get an accountant, how to make a practice protocol manual, how to start up a whole business. You will learn every single thing you need to know about how to open a business. Now, just going back to anatomy, um, we focus a lot on head and neck anatomy. That was one class, but we also had a separate class for the full body because everything, your mouth and everything is all connected. But we do have separate classes on head anatomy and the entire body anatomy. So, you know, being good at biology will definitely serve you there. That's an overview of the program, what you're going to be doing in classes in clinic. So just a bit more about the program itself. It is a small program. There's only 48 of you when you first start out. When you end, there might be a lot, a lot less than 48. Like I'm, you can tell this is not 48 people. These three are just instructors. You can count them out. There are 600 applicants for dental hygiene and 48 spots. So you can imagine just how competitive it is. And it is an accredited program. This is important. The dental hygiene program that you choose, if it's not St. Clair, it can be anywhere. Um, make sure it's accredited. Accreditation just is a certain like label that dental hygiene programs get from the Canadian Dental Education Organization. They just have certain standards that programs have to meet in order to qualify for your board exam that helps you get your license. So St. Clair is accredited, so that's why I could write my board exam. It is up to it's up to the standards. During your time uh, in dental hygiene school, you will have a bunch of written and practical exams but they can be vital because they can fail you out of the program. So you have to be someone who's constantly putting work in. You know, it's not like you study in week one and you come back to it like 14 weeks later. No, you have to constantly review because you will be tested on it all the time. And some exams will be like large enough to make you fail out of the program. And you don't want that happening. So at the end of all this, you receive an advanced diploma, which we will talk more about the advanced diploma part. So that's, you know, you kind of have a sense of what the program is, what's happening, how it works. Okay. I was also told to talk about a day in the life before COVID hit. So this is my schedule in year two. So this was between the months of September to December 2019. So I just color coded it for you. All the black dots you see are classes. So eight classes. All the red dots are clinic, and each clinic is about four hours long now. So you have about 12 hours of clinic each week, and the yellow is labs. So as you can see with the classes, they're heavily science-based. You know, you've got oral pathology, radiographic interpretation, you've got nutrition counseling, you've got healthcare, human pathophysiology, periodontics. I'm not going to get into what these classes are right now, 
but it's really heavy on classes and you have clinics on top of that. You know, you'll be maintaining your homework, your assignments, your tests, your exam, all while maintaining clinic as well. So in clinic, you have your own patient base. You have to create, you have to bring your own patients in. You have to work on them. You have to remind them about their appointments. You have to hope that they show up and don't ghost you. So, you know, you're maintaining a bunch of things at once. So, you know, the best thing I would say when you're in this situation is having a planner because a planner will save your life. You can plan weeks ahead. Every time something happens that's coming up in the next few days, you can write it down. And yeah, you have to make time to study. You have to make time to go to clinic and maintain your clients. And lastly, we have labs. So in labs, you will have here, you can see I have labs here from three to five. So this is a dental mature lab. So here is where we would learn how to make whitening trays and mouth guards. This is where we would learn to place braces as well. And we had one scheduled lab, but we all had to take extra labs to complete our assignments as well. So, you know, you kind of have to think about everything you're going through. You have to think about your class, if you work, your social life, your lab time, your clinic time. You know, everything has to be organized. So definitely to be in this program, you have to be able to manage your time well and you have to be able to, you know, be organized. If you're someone whose binder is just loose papers, you're going to have to put some tabs in there because, you know, you have to stay organized. You have to time manage. And, you know, a planner, especially when you're in this situation, is a game changer. I still have my planners from Dental Hygiene and I wish I could show it to you because it's just endless writing in there and it really helps you stay organized as well, you know. It's possible, you know, it's, this program is not impossible, but you just have to be able to be smart about it. Okay, so why did I choose dental hygiene? So dental hygiene is based on your grades from your prerequisites, and it is based on your entrance exam score. So if you're worried that your top six are not good enough, you know, dental hygiene doesn't really care about your top six. It just cares about that biochem and English and that entrance exam, and that's it. Dental hygienists are pretty unique because we are trained to work in every single specialty. So we can work in ortho, we can work in surgery, we can work in general practice, and pediatrics. You know, we're not like a dentist. A dentist has to be trained for one specific one. So you, they're either in braces, they're either in surgery, they're either in root canals, they're either in implants. You know, as a dental hygienist, I can work wherever I want because I've, I've studied all of those and I have been trained to work under all of those. So, you know, if I get bored of braces, I can go to dentures. If I get bored of dentures, I can go to implants. I can, you know, hop from space to space. And if you are not strong at, as math, dental hygiene is great because it really does not require much math. You know, if math is something that, you know, gives you anxiety, dental hygiene rarely ever has math. Now, some program highlights with St. Clair that just helps you as a dental hygienist. There's a lot of community experience. So, you know, we were supposed to work with the downtown mission and working in clinics, providing treatment to homeless people. But because of COVID, we could not do that. So instead, we did other kinds of community experience. We um, presented about oral health to nurses, to staff at long-term care homes. Here is just a screenshot I took. We did a um, presentation on vaping and oral health for the newcomer immigrant and refugee services. So we had this gentleman, uh, he was interpreting Arabic, and this man was doing it in Greek. So, you know, you kind of get to have that experience. You get to teach about it. This is the community work that I was talking to you guys about as that you do as a dental hygienist. In clinic, we also had kitty days. So this is where we were exposed how on, like, you know, how to work with kids. You know, we had kids come in from um, Dougal Public School. They were grade two and three, and we were providing them with treatment. So, you know, working with a kid who was seven years old is a lot different than working with a 30-year-old adult. So you're kind of getting the experience of how to work with kids as well. We had lab experience, which I told you about, and we have that community clinic, which is what I also explained to you. And at St. Clair, you have the job opportunity as a receptionist. So in your third and final year, you can work as a part-time receptionist, which is what I did, and it was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed it, and it was really good. It looks really gay. It looks really good on a um, resume as well. So when you go out to apply in different clinics and they see on your resume that you're working at a dental office as a dental receptionist, it really boosts your value. So, you know, if you do end up doing this program and you are in third year, definitely go ahead and apply for that receptionist position. It's really good work. All right, next we have, okay, so this is just another um, example of the community experience that we were, I was telling you about. So in the month of June, just this past June, our clinic made all of our services for free. So we made goodie bags. So it had um, toothbrush, toothpaste, floss, mouth rinse. 
we made blue bags for adults and white bags for kids. And we put a pamphlet in there that advertised our services. And then we went to a low income neighborhood and a senior home and we distributed about 400 of these bags. So we made a bunch of these bags. This is just, you know, two of us, but our, our entire class went. These are just the people I took photos with. So we were handing out all of this. So you do a lot of community work as well as a dental hygienist. It's not just clinically based. There's a variety of things you can do. So at the end of your dental hygiene program, you receive an advanced diploma. And if you're thinking, wow, all that work for a diploma, you can actually go ahead and get your bachelor's of science and dental hygiene degree as well. Now, this degree is 100% optional. You do not have to do it if you do not want to. If you would like a degree, you definitely could. So I'm talking about the University of Detroit Mercy because they have a collaboration a program with St. Clair College. So your credits from St. Clair College transfer over to the University of Detroit Mercy and your four-year dental hygiene program becomes one year. But to do this, you have to be an RDH. You have to have your license from the CDHO to do this. But this can be done at any time in your career. So if you want to do it one year in five years, 10 years, 50 years, you definitely can. All you need to have is your dental hygiene license. You do your one-year program at Detroit Mercy and you get an American degree in dental hygiene. And this is a bachelor's degree. It's just an undergrad. So during that one year, you have no dental courses. You just have general education electives. So that's where I am right now. I'm at Detroit Mercy at the moment. And I don't have any dental courses. It's I have history. I have drama. I have spirituality. Not really dental related. The only dental related you could call it is research. So we have a research class from the School of Dentistry and each of us have been tasked to research something that has not been studied yet in oral or general medicine. So we all have to develop our own research, carry it out, and then we are writing proposals, introductions, and reports. And you know if your research is good enough, you can get published. So my research currently it's in the developmental stages, but I am currently researching how electronic cigarettes, which is vapes, affect um, and progress with cavities leading to severe dental diseases and death. So, you know, that's kind of what you're doing here at Detroit Mercy along with your other courses. Um, I can't really tell you the tuition because the tuition is based on your classes and how many credits each class counts for. But when you are coming in from St. Clair to Detroit Mercy, you are eligible for an entrance scholarship based on your GPA. So if you had a good uh, GPA all throughout dental hygiene school, your overall GPA is really good. It's really high. You can get a maximum of, of a 12,000 scholarship, and that's in U.S. dollars. Now, with a degree, you can actually do a bunch of things. You can become a professor. So if you get sick of clinical dental hygiene after like two or three years, you can go ahead and teach if you'd like because you have the degree, you have the knowledge, you can definitely do that. You can open your own business, not like a clinical business. You definitely could if you wanted to, but you could manufacture your own products. So if you wanna make your own line of gauze or anything, you can definitely do that. You can work as a sales rep as well. So a lot of um, dental companies, they employ sales reps to go and um, advertise their products and give seminars on how to use their products. Or you can go into research, like how I said, you choose a topic, you research it, you write an article, you get published in a journal. You can do that with a degree as well. And just having a degree boosts your overall value as well. So that's how St. Clair's Dental Hygiene work. You do your three years in Canada and you do your one optional year in the US. And just another fun fact, like the dental hygiene school here also has their own clinic, but they also have a mobile like RV as well. It's just a little fun fact. Okay, so let's say um, you do not want to go to a college that offers dental hygiene. You know, there's a bunch of colleges in Ontario that do Algonquin, Niagara, Georgian, Conestoga, Fanshawe. I'm sure you guys have all heard of these colleges. I know you guys got your OUAC numbers yesterday, so you guys are probably thinking about colleges right now. But if you want to go to a university right away and do four years of dental hygiene, it's the same concept, same theory classes, same clinic, same lab, same community experiences. So there are three schools in Canada that do offer it. I'm sure there's more universities. These are just the three that I thought of. So Dalhousie University, which is in Halifax, Nova Scotia, offers a four-year dental hygiene program, and you end off with a bachelor's degree in dental hygiene. University of Alberta and UBC do the exact same thing. Um, so St. Clair actually has a collaboration with two uh, universities, UDM, which is Detroit Mercy, and UBC, which is uh, University of British Columbia here. 
If you don't want to do Detroit Mercy, you can always do it from UBC. UBC has an in-person degree completion program and, or you can do it 100% online as well. So if that's something you guys want to do as well, that's definitely a pathway as well. Okay, next. Okay, so I was also asked to speak about how involved I was in the community and school. So within the community, while I was a dental hygiene student, I was a student at the Muslim Youth Network. But after a year, I also began conducting classes for a year. In high school, I was pretty involved in the community as well. I completed over 200 hours of community service. I know the maximum was like 40 or something. Um, so I did my work at the library, the police force, the Salvation Army, and the Paralympics. So I just have a photo of 14-year-old me with the mayor of the town that I used to live at while I was at the Salvation Army for a food drive. As for school, I wasn't really part of anything in St. Clair, no like sports teams or clubs, but in high school, I was in the tennis team and badminton team. I played women's doubles and my partner and I were semifinalists in 2015 during provincials and 2016 for badminton. I was also, I dabbled a bit in archery as well. So that that's kind of how my involvement went. Okay, so now choosing dental hygiene. So now you know a bit about what school is like and what work as a professional is like. Now we're kind of going to differentiate between the advantages and the disadvantages of dental hygiene. The first and foremost advantage is opportunity for growth. So dental hygiene is ever evolving. There's always new stuff you're allowed to do. So the latest was September 2017, RDHs were allowed to write prescriptions for medications. Right now, what's in the works for registered dental hygienists is we are working to administer nitrous oxide. So if you don't know what nitrous oxide is, it's do you guys know that laughing gas, the funny, funny gas that when you're going for surgery, they put that mask over your mouth and you fall asleep. They do the surgery and you wake up. So that's nitrous oxide. So in Ontario, RDHs can administer nitrous oxide only under direct supervision of a dentist or a registered nurse. So the CDHO is currently talking with the Ministry of Ontario to have RDHs do that alone. So that would be a really great, um, you know, tool under our belt. You definitely have independence, as I spoke about earlier. You don't have to work with a dentist. You can work anywhere you want with whoever you want. You can be an entrepreneur. As an RDH, you are a primary health care provider. You know, you are an essential frontline worker, and I'll go into that a bit as well. So basically, as a dental hygienist, you are responsible for maintaining a patient's immune system by regulating their oral health, which prevents diseases, and it can even prevent pandemics. You know, our teeth harbor a lot of pathogens, which is disease-causing microorganisms. So if your teeth and mouth are not clean and you are harboring all of these bacteria, viruses, and fungal infections, you will cause yourself to become very sick. So as a dental hygienist, it is like the biggest duty to keep that under control. It's actually, um, there's actually a article that I was reading and they said that if your teeth are not clean enough, you are actually at higher risk for and just like another, you know, example, like if we pretend that we had no pandemic, that uh, photo I showed you earlier of all the buildup on those teeth, if that buildup stays, the bacteria within that buildup can actually lead a person to develop diabetes and dementia. Like, that's really crazy. So you have to make sure as a dental hygienist, what you are doing is maintaining their oral and overall health. Because, you know, if you are responsible for someone getting diabetes or de dementia, your license will be taken away. And as I mentioned before, you do not have to work in clinic all your life. You know, you can work as a professor, as clinic faculty, you can become an entrepreneur, or you can go into research. As for disadvantages, the biggest disadvantage is that it is a physically strenuous job. So you can see how this lady is sitting here. That is the best way to sit, but it is not always practical. So you know, your back hurts, your neck hurts, your shoulders, legs, wrists, fingers, and eyes. I'll get back to eyes. But, you know, maintaining this position for eight hours is not always possible because, you know, sometimes people have small mouths. You know, you can't really see, so you kind of have to hunch your back. You have to, like, angle your neck. So after a while, that can definitely hurt. But there's always ways to fix that. You can always maintain your posture. You can always maintain your client's posture. You know, when someone has a really small mouth and I can't really see, I ask them to lift their chin up so it's kind of elevated. I can look deeper inside. So you can definitely mean, uh, you can definitely manage yourself and the client without hurting yourself. And as for eyes, teeth are tiny, especially if you're working on a kid, the tooth is like this big. You can't see it. So your eyes get strained. You know, you ruin your eyesight. 
So something that a lot of dentists and dental hygienists do is they get loops. So loops are these things that you see here. So they're little binoculars that attach to your glasses. I'll show you what they do. So here is just regular looking at teeth without loops. And then here are the different magnifications that loops provide. So you can see 2.5, 3.5, 4, and 5. So you can see just how much we're zooming in. The most common magnification that people use is 2.5 because you can see like these ones are way too zoomed in. And you can see the effect is happening. Before loops, you're kind of hunched over, your neck is bent. But after loops, your back is straight, your neck is straight. It's going well. Okay, so that's, that's one of the disadvantages. And as for... Um, as for uh, dental hy hygienists, so because of COVID, we are number one at risk because we are performing physical services. So the CDHO has implemented a bunch of infection control guidelines on sterilization and, um, and even personal protection equipment. So I do have a little comparison photo. So here's pre-COVID October 2019. You can see I'm only wearing gloves and a mask. And past COVID in March 2021, you know, I'm wearing a gown, a face shield, my N95. So, you know, as, you know, things change with COVID, guidelines are also changing to, pre to prevent dental hygienists from getting COVID or any other illnesses. So it's definitely protected. You know, you have to maintain these protocols. You have to follow them in order to stay safe and in order to keep your clients safe. Okay, so now we've been talking a lot about what dental hygiene is, what, what you're going to be doing. Now you have to ask yourself, could you be a, an RDH? So, you know, I could ask you, you know, generic questions like, are you optimistic? Do you have leadership qualities? Which are great questions to ask yourself. But to be an RDH, you have to ask something that's a bit more specific. So first off, can you handle blood? You know, I've never had a client that has never bled. You know, there always, there's always going to be blood. So if blood kind of scares you, you might, not, you might not want to be a clinical RDH. You can go into teaching or you can go into research. Can you listen to patients? So, you know, a lot of patients will tell you uh, different symptoms that they're experiencing, things that they see in their mouth. You have to be able to listen properly and, you know, tell them, you know, what's going on. Do you have communication skills? So you will be communicating a lot, not just with your clients, but with others. I will get into that. So, you know, sometimes they will have a, a treatment could have three treatment options. You have to be able to explain the risks, the benefits, what could happen, long term effects. Can you act quickly without panic? So the dental clinic is actually grounds for medical emergencies. We always have asthma attacks, heart attacks, angina attacks, respiratory failure, diabetic coma. You have to be able to kind of become a Jedi. You kind of have to like remember your training and act on the spot. So if you can act quickly without panic, then you will be good. And the most important, can you handle saliva, vomit, pus, and human tissue? Because these are all the fluids you will be working with every single day, especially if you're working with kids. You know, uh, kids will throw up on you all the time, especially if you are working in orthodontics and you're taking impressions, which if you've had braces, you've had that done, kids will throw up on you. So you have to be able to handle all of that. Do you have good note taking skills? So a lot of dental hygiene is actually documentation. So after every appointment, you have to document what you said, what you did, what the client said, what the client did. Even something as small as the client coming 10 minutes late, you have to document it because if that client comes back, after one month, two months, two years, and they say that you did something that you didn't, your notes will back you up. And that could save you in a court case as well, and it could save your license. You guys have probably noticed that dental offices close really early. They close around 6 or 7 p.m. It's not actually closed. Everybody's inside making their notes for a good two hours. That's how important note-taking is because it can save you from liability and malpractice. Um, I know like a lot of shows, like medical shows, like Grey's Anatomy, there's a lot of malpractice. Uh, cases in there. So if you do have you if you have seen those shows, you know just how big of a deal malpractice is, and you have to be very careful. Lastly, are you observant with little details? That is very important because not just when you're looking at the head or neck or in the mouth, but even in things such as X-rays. You know, when you take like this is an X-ray that I took um, in March. You have to be able to look at this and you have to be able to identify what's normal, what's abnormal, where's the disease, where's the cavities. You have to be very observant because if you miss something and it causes a problem like three years from now, you will be held accountable for it. So you have to be, if you're good at observing things, then you will be doing really well in clinical dental hygiene. All right, next we have some more points to consider. 
So can you work with your hands? That's really big for clinical. As I told you before, like it's so physically strenuous, you have to be able to work properly with your hands. You know, if your hands cramp up a lot, maybe clinical is not the best. You can always go into research or um, become a professor. Are you a team player? You know, a lot of dental offices, there's two receptionists, two dentists, three dental assistants, three hygienists. You know, you have to be able to be someone who communicates well with others. Do you get along with other people? As a dental hygienist, you are not just, it's not just you and your client. It's you and the entire community. You have to be able to work with other healthcare providers. So you'll be working with psychologists, psychiatrists, the client's physician, optometrists, pharmacists. You are working with everybody. You could be working with interpreters. You know, let's say someone is mute or they can't talk. They have Parkinson's. They can't talk. They will have an interpreter with them and you have to talk to the interpreter. If they have um, physical diseases such as um, muscular dystrophy, they're going to have a caregiver. You have to be able to communicate with the caregiver and tell them all the proper instructions and everything. A lot of clients have service dogs. You know, can you accommodate a service dog? Do you know how to work around a service dog? That's the big thing. Of course, clients, insurance companies, you will be working with them a lot. Public health and WeChu. So if you don't know what WeChu is, it's the health unit. So hygienists do a lot of community work, so they are very closely tied with public health and the health unit. Another two that's really important is Windsor Police and the Children's Aid Society. Now, you're probably wondering how did a dental hygienist get involved with the police? Well, it's actually really important because as a dental hygienist, you are legally obligated to report any signs of abuse that you might see. Now, that doesn't just mean bruises on someone's arm. That can even mean cavities. So I have an example for you. Let's say I have, oh, I'm sorry. Let's say I have this three-year-old child who comes to me, and you can see just how badly their cavities are. Cavities are already, the teeth are pretty much gone. The child cannot eat. The child cannot speak properly. That is very concerning. That would count as child abuse and parental neglect. And as a dental hygienist working under the CDHO, I am legally and morally obligated to report that to the police and Children's Aid Society. They would come, they would take the parent and the child, and they would go from there with whatever their protocols are. It might sound mean that while well, you're calling the police on someone because they have a cavity. At this point, no, it's not. When it's so severe, you are legally obligated because you have to understand that working as a dental hygienist, you are not just taking care of their teeth. You're taking care of their entire body, and you are also considering their safety. So the safety of the child in a case like this, a case this bad, is considered child abuse and parental neglect because, you know, you don't have to be a dental professional to know that this is bad. You know, if this starts happening as a parent, you have to take your kid in right away. Otherwise, it will lead to different social and medical problems and it could cause you to face jail time as well. So we work a lot with the police and the Children's Aid Society. Now, if you don't report cases like these, it's it's malpractice. You know, your in, your license can either be suspended for a few months or you could be it can be taken away. Next is the paramedics, you know, if there's a medical emergency and city council, as I told you about with the fluoride example. Now, the is, do I understand biology well? So as I told you, dental hygiene is very heavy with diseases, anatomy and nutrition and you know things like microbiology all your classes all the things you're doing everything's biology oriented so if, if biology is something you enjoy then you will you will have fun in dental hygiene school because that's what, what you're going to be doing all day you know there's not really like biology labs or chemistry labs you won't be doing titration or anything but all your knowledge will stem from biology so if you like biology you should consider it you would do really well in it all right now, just a quick review of what we spoke about. So we spoke about dental hygiene as a profession. We talked about the duties and responsibilities that you are expected to maintain and uphold. We talked about schooling in the high school first level. We talked about duties and responsibilities and how to determine if dental hygiene is a good choice for, the, for you. Like, are you a team player? Can you handle blood? Can you do this, this, and this? So that's what I have for you. So if anyone has any questions, you can go ahead and ask them. If you don't feel like, you know, seeing them in the group, I will leave my like email and my um, phone number up there. So you can definitely contact me. I know the um, MSA Instagram did tag me in their post for today's event. So if you want to shoot me a DM, that's fine as well. All right.
Moving on, okay, so if you are interested in St. Clair's Dental Hygiene Program, just go into Google and type in St. Clair Dental Hygiene, or you can type in St. Clair H800, that's the program code, and it will bring you to this page. So there are some good points here. First off, it'll show you your courses. So it's six semesters, so it's three years, and you will see the course codes, the amount of credit hours you have, all the courses. So, you know, if you want to know what the courses are like, you can just click on the course code and it'll tell you exactly what you do in that course. So you have the entire program right in front of you. Another great thing is it has paying for college, so it has information on OSAP. You know, St. Clair College has a lot of student scholarships you can apply for as well. They're very easy to get. Um, you don't have to write a 3,000 word essay or do some crazy interview. You just write a small paragraph about why you need the money and you get it easily. Um, another thing is if you do have more detailed questions about the uh, program, you can contact Rana Bazi. She is the coordinator for the program and Rana is great. She'll get back to you within a day or two. She's pretty quick. And if you would like to apply, just hit on this domestic button. It will take you to the OCAS website and that's the um, Ontario College's application site. It'll take you straight to OCAS. You can go ahead and apply from there. I think the fee is 90 or 95 to apply to five colleges. I haven't, I haven't applied since like 2018, so I don't remember the entire process, is, but you can definitely apply from this button here. So that we will give you all the information for St. Clair Dental Hygiene. All right, just to end off in like a fun way, I know we talked about a lot of heavy stuff. So I want you guys to know that dental hygienists, they are known, appreciated, and loved. One cool thing is that October, which is the month we are in right now, is actually National Dental Hygiene Month. So a lot of dental hygienists are celebrating this month. There's um, a lot of dental hygiene like merchandise stores. They have a lot of sales going on during this month. Another thing that we have in Canada and the US is NDHW, which is the National Dental Hygienist Week. So that is every April 4th to 10th. And during National Dental Hygienist Week, you will hear a lot of put your purple on. And that is because purple is the official color for dental hygiene. And it is actually celebrated in a really great way. So Canada celebrates NDHW throughout all nine or 10 provinces and three territories by lighting up certain parts of the city purple. So I have a list of all the purple sites that were in Ontario this past April. So it's all, all of these sites were purple. So I just highlighted a few ones that you guys would know, but they were everywhere. You have Wellington, London, Welland, Brampton, Hamilton. But London City Hall was purple from the, the 1st to the 7th. The CN Tower and Niagara Falls was purple um, on the 9th. So that's just some photos from that day. So, you know, these places light up and, you know, it symbolizes Dell Hygienists and it's really fun and cool. Alrighty. And that is it. Thank you, everyone, for listening to me ramble about all of this. So if you do have any questions, you can go ahead and, um, Brother Avon, are they allowed to unmute themselves and talk? If not, if you guys want to shoot me an email or a text or a DM, that's fine, too. But if you guys have questions, definitely go ahead and ask them now. Yeah, for sure. Uh, ask. Uh, I'd just like to say to that, that was um, very insightful information. Um, and I really learned a lot. I wasn't during this before, but your presentation really has made me kind of think about it a little bit. Yeah, for sure. Thank you so much. I'm glad you guys got to see like every aspect of it. I think I have to end the sharing to see the chat. I'm not sure if there's any questions in there. Um, Or concerns, or they'd like you to expand on anything, go, you can go ahead and ask that now. Well, I think we're good then. <laughs> <laughs>